Hello, everybody. Just giving you all a second or two as you file in. Thanks for coming around today. This is the 106th Brooklyn Rail Wednesday afternoon reading. And we have uh, developed a new system of naming each reading, giving each reading its own title. And this is, this reading is Sex is Not the End, a rail reading curated by Claire Donato. I will introduce uh, Claire in just a second, but I just wanna uh, let everybody know that if you're coming here to one of these readings for the first time, you should pay attention to the chat or you might pay attention to the chat as each reader will have links to their various uh, works and endeavors posted while they're reading. And you'll also find out information about the rail itself. The uh, October issue of the Brooklyn Rail just went live um, last night. So that's that's online. And uh, my name is Anselm Berrigan. I'm the editor of the poetry section and also um, co-organizer of these Wednesday readings. Joining it will be Jeff Alessandrelli, Orna Goralnik, Anna Moskovakis, Jamie Stewart, and Jameson Webster. Claire is going to introduce each of them uh, when it's their time to go. Claire is a poet and prose writer. Her book, Wobegon, is forthcoming in 2023 from Theophora Editions. She's also the author of a novella, Burial, and The Second Body, a collection of poems. She is at work on her first New York Times bestseller. Currently, she is the assistant chairperson of writing at Pratt Institute, where she received the 2020-21 Distinguished Teacher Award. Please welcome Claire Donato to the Brooklyn Rail. Thanks so much, Anselm, and my gratitude to the Rail for asking me to curate its 106th reading. Um, the New York Times sentence is a joke. <laughs> um, I'm just going to jump into a formal introduction I wrote for the event, and as Anselm said, I will introduce each reader in between. The order today is Jeff, Jameson, Anna, Jamie, and Orna. I conceived this reading, Sex is Not the End, in mid-September while thinking about what threads bind Jeff, Orna, Anna, Jamie, and Jameson's work. These are five writers whose practices, ideas, and language permeate my daily thoughts and whose work I would follow to the end of the world. I am not too proud to confess that I am a super fan of every person on this bill. The artists sharing their work with us this afternoon write across a range of sexual affects, abased, attached, addicted, abstaining, participating, healing. In the spirit of coupling, there are two memoirists, excuse me, that's Wobogon the cat. In the spirit of coupling, there are two memoirists, two poet novelists and two psychoanalysts, though these terms are wet. Threesomes, foursomes, fivesomes, multiple partners gather in the Zoom dollhouse to language their coitus. An egg breaks open on an analyst's couch, smearing her yolk. Sex is not the end is a provocation, a mantra, and a death protection spell. I find it soothing. Psychoanalysis actively grapples with endings and how endings may lead to the articulation of one's desires. And, quote, sex is the world our desires produce, says artist Melanie Hoff. Yet, sex and desire are not always mutually exclusive. Nor is sex merely a physical act, but rather something imaginative, an act of world building. I think here of Jeff Alessandrelli's And Yet, 
which interrogates sexuality as a speculative fiction in a radical interpretation of this moon dust coded literary term. And perhaps many of the readers on this bill could stake the same claim. Ultimately, the question as to whether our desires are ever truly our own remains open-ended. And as light is cast upon one's desire, obviously one is not cured or set free. To this end, sex is not the end, aims to begin a conversation about loss. I'm going to <laughs> introduce Jeff Allison Drelli. My cat was on the keyboard. When Anselm asked me to curate this reading, the Portland-based polymath Jeff Allison Drelli first came to mind. Last spring, I met Jeff in person and he gave me a copy of his new book, And Yet, which meditates on shyness, sexual avoidance, and a course of therapeutic treatment. It is a curious and strangely funny document about which I wrote for Fence. Jeff is a loyal friend and postal mail interlocutor, a Ray Johnson enthusiast, and caregiver to a highly esteemed 15-year-old black lab pit bull named Beckett. He's also the publisher of Phonograph Editions, a Portland-based press which publishes books and LP records. Please welcome Jeff. All right, thank you so much, Claire. Um, and thanks to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna read a little bit from my book, And Yet, which came out in June, um, which is, uh, it focuses on selfhood, shyness, and sex, and kind of uh, the fear of those things. Um, it's fictional, but there are a lot of cultural kind of anecdotes and quotes. Um, that by various writers and artists that are um, are real. So the section I'm gonna read is when the protagonist is going back to therapy. Um, he lives in the Midwest um, after kind of being away from therapy for a while. At the end of car crash while hitchhiking, the first story in Dennis, De Dennis Johnson's collection, Jesus' His Son, the unnamed narrator, involved in the deathly crash but completely unscathed, tells a doctor imploring him to get checked out, there's nothing wrong with me. Thinking back on the moment later, he relates, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm surprised I let those words out. But it's always been my tendency to lie to doctors, as if good health consisted only of the ability to fool them. Most patients aren't in as dire straits as the narrator of car crash while hit hitchhiking. But due to embarrassment or fear of being judged, lying to one's doctor is prevalent in Western society. To be clear, these are often white lies, not life-threatening ones. Still a white lie is a half-truth, is a real fib. Different than some of my male peers, I'd sought out therapy twice before in my life at the ages of 25 and 27. Both times I'd found the experience frustrating. I'd talked, I'd listened, had worked on rational self-management and the immediate recognizing and harnessing of my automatic negative thoughts. Even so, nothing had really changed. Only talking to my therapist for a total of three hours a month and seeing each for at most four months at a time before abandoning everything hadn't helped. That's like trying to cure a migraine by wrapping an ACE bandage tightly around your head and thinking happy, peaceful, anti-migraine thoughts. Is how my friend V once described my therapeutic experience to me in an email. You're not really doing anything and don't sound like you really want to do anything, but by telling your therapist that you want to try, you're trying to tell yourself. It sounds like a sort of lie, V wrote. Her mother having abandoned her family when she was three before later committing suicide when V was eight, V herself had been in therapy for years with considerable success. If you're willing, it can be there for you, but it's up to you, not the therapist. From the diaries of Italian poet Cesar Pavese, December 25th, 1937. There is something sadder than growing old, remaining a child. Back then I told my therapist I was insecure and left it at that. True, but only part way. 
older now and still searching, I aim to lay it out, to not lie at all, nor consciously at least self-aggrandize. Prudently or not, my guide here was the writer and theater artist Spalding Gray, whose work I discovered early in my sojourn in Missouri and found revelatory for its insistence on interrogation and unvarnished directness of self. Perishing by suicide in January 2004, in December 1985, Spalding Gray wrote, the whole process of writing has been very healing to the extent that it is projected into me a future. And although this cannot fully assure a future, it has at least created one for me to move for to move toward as I watch it race ahead before me. And yet. The first two therapists I found online, Googling Blue Cross, Blue Shield, talk therapy coverage, sexuality, self-esteem, relationships. The last I found by recommendation of a friend of a friend. Both bespeckled, married, middle-aged, straight white men from the Midwest is hard for me now to differentiate between those first two. Ted was number one, Steve was number two. Ted had slightly receding dusky blonde hair, a penchant for wearing Crocs with socks, and a friendly disposition that simultaneously soothed and irked me. Hair colored dusky blonde also. Steve had a starchy crew cut, gracelessly aspiring to faux hawk, a penchant for wearing dark green V-neck sweaters, and a friendly disposition that simultaneously soothed and irked me. I laid it out as truthfully as possible, or at least tried to. I told Ted Steve that I've been celibate for a year and nine months, willfully, willfully for the first year, but not for the last nine months. I told them that during that period, I'd isolated myself and was very lonely. I told them that I didn't care much, that I didn't much care for the Midwest and how once I finished school, I planned on leaving the area forever. I told them that I loved my family, my parents and younger brother, but felt somewhat distant from them emotionally. I told them that with new romantic partners, I was always initially shy sexually, and that sometimes that shyness overwhelmed my sense of sexual self, both in the moment and down the line, months or even years later. I told them that so far as I understood the word, I'd only been in love once, and it had been years ago with the woman who broke up with me for someone older and more successful. I told them that despite my intimacy issues or whatever you want to call them, I had slept with multiple women, more actually than the national average for a man my age. They by chance know the national average for a man my age, and in terms of prowess and proficiency, felt I was a serviceable lover, if somewhat unadventurous. Spurious facade, I told them that I thought stereotypical masculinity was a sham, but a sham I nevertheless felt inclined to live in. Why? Is it because I was so afraid of my masculinity that masculinity that I felt intoxicated by that fear? I told them that even if I wasn't sure who I was from moment to moment, day to day, I often absorbedly live inside my head to a probably unhealthy extent, and that this self-absorption seemed to be, for an aspiring writer at least, both problem and solution. I told them that the concept of lust as grief seemed to be a silly one to me. Walking back from the bar alone or driving my car next to the dense green, empty cornfields everywhere around me, I couldn't help but believe in it nevertheless. I told them that I loved to read, but felt that sometimes I used this love as a way to mask my own personal feelings, sentiments, and beliefs, repurposing the words and articulations of others as proxies or stand-ins for my own. I told them I had a robust scope of imagination, which both helped and hindered me. I told them I drank too much water and too much alcohol, and the former was contributing to my constant urination issues and the latter my depression. I told them that learning was important to me, to me, but that with regards to academic learning specifically, at this point I'd been the higher education system for higher education system for nearly eight years. It was no doubt holding me back vis-a-vis -vis the many societal fundaments and directives embedded in the real world that I still wasn't aware of or privy to. I told them if I was being honest with myself, I tended to run from my problems rather than face them, that I moved around a lot as a result of this, that my geographical wanderlust no doubt, no doubt had personal consequences for me. I told them that I was a very lucky person, incredibly privileged, and that I regularly forgot about this fact or downplayed it. I told them that the possibility of the private past becoming the public present scared and titillated me. I told them repeatedly, above all else, that with so much stuff out there, I wondered where my own stuff might one day sooner far fit in, and how a monastic life of quiet reflection seemed ideal and impossible to me. 
I told them that I felt like I was living inside a box of my own creation and that although initially I had welcomed this, even luxuriated in it, now it felt like a trap. A la Spalding Gray, I sometimes gesticulated wildly while conferring all of the above to Ted Steve. At other times, I stared at Ted Steve's benignly shuffling feet or into Ted Steve's four slowly blinking eyes. That I was terminally unique, forever a shining star shining bright is what in between the lines I also told Ted Steve. From the diaries of Cesar Pivince, August 29th, 1944, only uniqueness justifies the absolute value which puts us above all contingencies. I'll stop there. That was amazing and a great way to launch the afternoon. Thank you so much for sharing. Next up, we have Jameson Webster. I've been following Dr. Jameson Webster's work for five years and try to read everything she writes and to listen to her interviews and lectures when they're released. She's a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst who weaves her practice with avant-garde performance, poetics, and lyric writing. In 2018, I attended an immersive theatrical installation she helped put on in a former limousine garage called Sick exclamation point, the psychoanalytic field hospital. The installation was a critique of the mental health industrial complex and attendees underwent faux intake sessions with 20 professional psychoanalysts, including Jameson. I was assigned to Jameson and remember how my heart butterflied as she read me her questionnaire. She has a warm presence is generous with her time and mind and is a beloved teacher. She's also an activist. At the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, she volunteered at Mount Sinai Hospital. Quote, I would risk my life because it feels like a call of duty, end quote. She told the New York Post in a May 2020 Hero of the Day interview. Please welcome Jameson Webster. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, thank you to all the participants. I really <laughs> enjoyed that last reading. Um, Ted Steve. I'm going to read from uh, a book that was just published in June and is a collection of essays and I've sort of uh, Frankenstein some pieces together that spoke to me about the theme that Claire had put before us. Uh, this is a vignette from a case study by Selma Freiburg to start. There's a clinical case of Selma Freiberg's discussed in her 1972 article with this amazing title that only mid-century psychoanalysis could come up with, some characteristics of genital arousal and discharge in latency age girls. Freiberg investigates genital arousal in prepubescent girls, the awareness of their vagina, early experiences of vaginal orgasm, and states of genital anesthesia in children and adult analysands. She's interested in a particular kind of turning away from peaks of excitement and experiences of pleasure that feel unending. The search for this lost pleasure is what she then hears repeated in her adult female analysands. Freiburg asks a little girl she names Nancy to explain her feelings that she says, quote, don't get finished and frighten her. She says, you know what it's like? It's like when you're playing the piano. Suppose you play do, re, mi, and fa. Well, the fa is just like crying for the soul to get finished. It's like a baby whining for its mother. Do the feelings ever get finished, Freiburg asks her. Well, no, says Nancy, seemingly annoyed that Freiburg has failed to comment on the extraordinary articulation that she gives to the problem at hand. She then launches into an explanation again of what it's right, of what it's like. Nancy says, all right, it went like this. Parentheses, Freiburg, she now sang in a queer atonal voice using of all things the first phrase of my country tis of thee. All right, it goes like this. My country tis, my country tis, my country tis, my country tis. She seemed prepared to repeat this interminably. Freiburg, finally I asked, and how does it get finished? Nancy, well, it ends when I go to sleep. 
When I think about sex, as psychoanalysis conceives of it, I hear the phrase water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink from Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Granted, this is a particularly hysterical way of parsing a problem replete with voracious orality and emphasis on dissatisfaction and a more metaphoric density bordering on confusion, but why not begin with a confession of my oral issues? It's impetuous and it knows no bounds and I simply love the pleasures of the mouth. I'm telling you that it's a sexual desert out there while speaking to the reality of sexual fluids and a desire for fluid-like sexual exchange. I'm telling you my concerns about a contemporary kind of sexual anorexia or sexual dehydration. Sex is sometimes felt as a curse and not a cure, though for the ancient mariner, the cure was to learn to love the albatross and not to fear it. To this end, I wanna to speak to the importance of sex and the rarity of sex in the psychoanalytic sense. The extreme search one has to engage in define what can assuage a thirst. Sex has the power to bring something revelatory, a satisfaction that we named sexual, which changes something in reality for a given person. At my most open, which is rare, I want us all to be on this adventure. For psychoanalysis, sex and civilization are in a tight dialectical relationship. Human sexuality is unnatural, meaning it goes beyond the program that can define life. Sex needs to create forms that can meet its anarchic, unquenchable nature. Sex presses us up against the ways we attempt to organize its excess, sex disorganizes. What might contain it? Whatever our solutions or satisfactions from artistic expressions to scientific inventions, the multitude of institutions centered on the body, on education, on consumerism, and on the family, these are always only partial solutions for a time, perhaps for one individual or for one specific societal locale. If we start to fear that we cannot offer adequate containment, we can initiate attempts to bring desire under wraps and at our most violent kill it, desiccate the environs even at our own cost. This desire and its impediments, civilization and its discontents defines what psychoanalysis understands about human life as sex life. I'm reminded of my water breaking. I recently had a daughter and the panic it induced in the medical personnel who needed the waters of the breaking of waters to line up with the readiness to give birth. It does not. So they forced the issue and it's unpleasant, a series of painful interventions that make you wonder who invented them and whether it was with the actual body with sexual organs in mind. As a psychoanalyst in my experience, the strangest and cruelest practices are driven from the places where medical attention to the body and the question of sex are close. You get a feeling that the sexuality of bodies brings medical practitioners to, towards something that they don't understand, perhaps don't want to understand and need to feel as separate from the work that they do. Sex and psychoanalysis at its most cliched often brings up the trope of a desire to return to the womb, reverse birth as a return to water, to the safe environs of the motherland. But the psychoanalytic message emphasizes the barriers to this fantasy. We humans cannot return to the womb because billions of years ago, we crawled from the seas onto land. Our time in amniotic fluids isn't even a memory, even when it is a reality, even when it is our point of origin. It only exists now in the form of a desire that is forced to search for it knows not what. The ice age for Freud when the seas dried up or froze is the mythic moment of the birth of neurotic sexuality, human sexuality stranded on land. The project is a pursuit of a more fluid sexuality that is somehow origin and end. And this is the question of sex and psychoanalysis as I understand it. In a book about sex, I decided to shift to a word that has organ in it, importantly in the form of its undoing. Lacan remarked that post-coitus, our organs are sidelined. We are stripped of them, uncocked as intensity leaves our body. Perhaps he wonders this is the point of orgasm, taking us, our wishes and expectations down a notch, leaving us with nothing but scattered memories and traces of excitement and tenderness, a way of grasping at after pleasure. These pieces of sex life are what we have, a minimal organization, a kind of disordered, disordered amalgam but a very precious one. I recently encountered Oliver Davis in Tim Dean's book, Hatred of Sex, which opens with this polemical provocation. Like democracy, sex is messy and disordering, hateable as well as desirable. 
The question for them is how to welcome the disorder and the disorganizing force of sex and democracy and the ways that resistance to it, indeed hatred of it, are being utilized for the purposes of anti-democratic power. This is the contemporary crisis the authors see in rising autocracies, no less in multiplying conspiracies like QAnon, these organs of organization. Here, Davis and Dean contextualize the term hatred. Sex betokens the highly complex relationship that all humans have with their body's capacity for intense, even excessive pleasure. It is underestimated the difficulty of that relationship with one's own pleasure that prompts us to speak in terms of a distinct hatred of sex. The question of the psychoanalytic cure touches psychoanalysis with respect to its knowledge, its institutes, and the passing down of what we think we know or what we learn from our patients. We have to ask a certain question. What organization is possible that allows for the place of disorganization, messiness, and difficulty? The story of psychoanalytic institutes and psychoanalytic training unfortunately does not fare well in this arena. There's a calcification of sexuality in our institutional forms and our bureaucratic regulations. But Freud had the audacity to imagine a civilization that could tolerate the sheer multiplicity of sexuality, the singularity of individual styles of pleasure and unpleasure of which the psychoanalyst has the odd glimpse in their clinical work with so many patients. The psychoanalyst is the one who takes on the burden of disorganization and tries at all costs to do something other than make it go away. We do so with no guarantee and with great risk. We do so having to test everything on ourselves first, knowing that where we falter, step back, we will never be able to lead our patients all that much further. But can't you almost envision a form of democracy that takes on this manner, this same weight of responsibility? Water everywhere. Just this evening, when I was writing it, my daughter and I were playing at taking turns sucking on each other's faces, my chin, her mouth, my cheek, her neck. The pleasure was ecstatic, not just because of the pleasure of sucking, the pleasure of the lips and the tongue, but also the game of it, the furtive exchange of gazes, the unfolding and developing rhythms, the play of choice around where, when, how hard, and always a question of when to stop. It was late, she soon grew tired. When infants are sleepy, they are disorganized. Like loose ends, their bodies fray around the edges and they are unsure of what to do with themselves. Sometimes her knees buckle out from under her. Many times she does something very special at this place of disorganization, which I've come to marvel at. She invents something new. She invents it as a way to soothe herself, as a way of extending pleasure and as a means of falling asleep, no doubt entering that miraculous space of disorganization known as dreamlike. It's a little like why we have our patients lie down on the couch to get closer to this. Tonight, she figured out that not only could she suck, she could blow, and she could make the most incredible noises, which she created a whole song that made me laugh and laugh and laugh, which pleased her, but not any more than she had already pleased herself. I know because once I was quiet, she continued as if I wasn't there, refining her instrument, playing her new organ until she slept. Thank you. So beautiful, Jameson, thank you. Water everywhere. Next up we have Anna. Anna Muscovakis is a role model for me and countless other young writers and creative thinkers. I had the privilege of reading her forthcoming novel, Participation, um, which is coming out on November 8th from Coffee House Press in draft form and admire its lucid descriptions of desire, divorce, and the subtle erotics that exist in reading groups. I was delighted to co-teach a course with Anna at Pratt Institute in spring 2019 and to talk about her book's themes during train rides to and from our classes and over shared meals at Sisters in Clinton Hill. The magic of reading participation in draft form made me know I had to invite her here today. Please welcome Anna. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It is a total thrill to be with these readers. 
Uh, I really wanted also, I just received these books and I don't know how to read yet from them. So I'm going to try. Um, and I wanted to Frankenstein something together, but I got really sick yesterday. So I might cough. Um, and, and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> um, so uh, this is from a little bit into the book. Um, I'm going to read like two and a half very short sections. And um, I don't know if you really need to know much, but um, the narrator is known as E. She has three jobs. She's in two reading groups. She kind of jokingly calls them love and anti-love. Love is on online only. And she's recently developed an erotic interest in S who's part of the love group. And um, one of her jobs is as a mediator in training and her mentor has disappeared. And I think that should be enough to know. Oh, and one of her bosses, she calls the capitalist. I think that might come, come in here as well as various members of the reading groups. My memory for books is bad. When I try to recall them, it's as if whole passages and themes have been swiped away, not just passages and themes. Let me give you an example. The first paragraphs of Pascal's Pensée propose a distinction between intuitive thinkers and mathematical thinkers, between thought supported obliquely by common observation and thought supported directly by rarefied fact. I follow this distinction. I am a delighted reader. Entering Pascal's numbered paragraphs, my delight is bodily, a flood of recognition. He is speaking to me. But the second paragraph speaks of men, makes clear that it speaks only of men, and I am not a man. This revision, too, I feel in my body as an assault. He is not speaking to me, a small sword, swipe, swipe. The paragraphs at the outset nearly alternate. To me, not to me. To me again, swipe, swipe, swipe. Of course, even the paragraphs I read as being addressed to me are not in fact addressed to me. But I learned long ago how, in the absence of explicit reminders of my ineligibility, to contort myself to gain entry where I wanted when I could. This is a metaphor borrowed from the psychoanalyst, the way creatures under threat will rearrange their bodies to minimize pain. Minimizing pain must be distinct from maximizing pleasure. But when it comes to reading for identification, for recognition, there can seem to be no air between them. In the best cases, when you read something, you feel like you've known it forever. In the best cases, you feel like it read you first. The first time I read Pensee or any number of books, of stories, countless examples come to mind. I understood the fact of this small sword of exclusion. I felt it, and yet I wanted still to love. I imagine this scene and its aftermath. Love swipes at the sword of exclusion with its bare hand, bleeds, scars over. Partial recall, its attendant insecurity and doubt, is the aftermath. Partial recall, the difference left when recognition is subtracted from love. Remember this when soon we ask the capitalist about the peak end rule. Remember how I calculated this difference for you. When I say that I wanted to love Pascal or other books on the originary stack, I mean that I wanted, that I needed to be addressed and I was outside the field of address. When I say that the swiping away of the sword results in a scar, I mean there is a numbness that arrives on the scene. Researchers at the intersection of psychoanalysis and brain science have documented the damage that occurs to children who are not sufficiently routinely addressed. A blurring occurs that is dysregulating that is dangerous. Once the damage is located squarely in the past, the scar itself can be measured, tended to. The lingering blur is less frightening to look at, but is also harder to understand. The blur may offer a way to think about having a bad memory. We know it from our everywhere screens, how a swipe leaves a smudge. More substitutions. I can't stop thinking about S. Instead of writing to them per se, I send an excerpt of my notes about the husband and the wife with cameos from the capitalist, the anarchist, and the rest. I have no expectation that S will write me back, but I find that I'm having thoughts about them and that the thoughts are, categorically speaking, more erotic than filial. 
I find that there is something very specific about having erotic thoughts concerning a person whose appearance is so wholly unknown to me, who is without, among other things, a communicated gender. I find that under the circumstances, certain body parts are easier to picture than others. The lips, the soles of the feet, the asshole, the shadowy region behind the ear. These become, when I think about S, the primary erogenous zones. Sometimes, inadvertently, the image of these parts, the ones I have glimpsed, i.e. the first and last in my little list, on the body of the capitalist substitute themselves in for the mystery parts of S. In the back of my mind, I know I will see the capitalist again at a scheduled meeting for work, at a series of scheduled meetings that runs no risk, unlike the love sessions of being suddenly discontinued. This raises the question, of course, of the relation between availability and desire. Meanwhile, my mentor is still on the run, on the run, on the lam. My mentor is a mystery. I wonder if I've been sufficiently trained to continue our sessions with the clients without supervision. There is an imbalance of access. I have the client's contact information, but they don't have mine. Should I call the wayward daughter and her harried single dad? Should I email the husband and the wife? I am not sure who I should be, who I am. I've never found it easy to be clear about my role. I stare at the client's information on my phone's bright screen. My phone rings. The second worker at the cafe bar is out with the flu. I put on my coat. Triangulation. E, did you know that Ethel Kennedy was administered LSD therapeutically and that when it was outlawed by the newly formed FDA in 66, Bobby protested its suppression and defended its life altering potential? I was sitting on a friend's couch with the friend's partner, Pablo, talking about drugs. The timeline's blurry. This wasn't long ago. Soon the conversation turned to Pablo's relationship with my friend. Duration and frequency, Pablo offered, are all there is really to measure. Why do we need definitions, labels, primacy? Shouldn't comparatively large doses of duration and frequency be enough? Something had been troubling me in the back of my mind which moved to the front of it as a result of the question Pablo posed. The troubling thing is an old story, possibly the oldest, embarrassing to admit, in the same way that trying to get at something true about the erotic was embarrassing the last time anti-love met. It's a question about the nature of reality and whether it can be shared. The part that had been troubling me was the way this question intersects with the pra practice of mediation, the way it intersects even with the definition of the term. I once met a mathematician at a party who told me her field was intuitionism. I couldn't understand what little explanation she attempted to offer that night over the music, prints, and the wine, boxed. When I looked up the term later, I found this. Intuitionism is based on the idea that mathematics is a creation of the mind. The truth of a mathematical statement can only be conceived via a mental construction that proves it to be true. And the communication between mathemat mathematicians only serves as a means to create the same mental process in different minds. Emphasis, mine. Now that I am able to observe my own limited practice of mediation from the compromised vantage of the cartographer, I can begin to wonder about the outsized role description plays in the process. All of the labor, all of the back and forth between parties is successful only to the extent that the parties can agree about how their feelings and how their relation should be described. Even in the best case outcomes, again, my sample is small, six or seven cases, but varied. The relation itself rarely changes. Enemies don't become friends or ex-partners reunite. The feelings don't change either, though sometimes they soften. What changes is that in place of two divergent, conflicting realities, an extended process of triangulation has produced a single description about which, no matter how much regret and pain it contains, both parties can agree. The same mental process created in different minds. While Pablo and I were talking about drugs and about love and then about the anarchist philosopher of science and so on, we left the space of another person between us on the couch as if reserving the space, though it was cold in the room and we are both inclined toward touch for my absent friend. This, 
despite very low levels of duration and frequency between Pablo and me. Thank you, Anna. You were reading from the physical book. Oh, just muted. Let's see, I think you were muted as you spoke. I, I just said I was reading from the Canadian edition because it has bigger type and my eyes are getting really <laughs> May we see it quickly before? Yeah, next this is the coffee house version and this is the Canadian. Beautiful. Congratulations. Book hug. Thank you. Next up, we have Jamie Stewart. Over the past year, I've been thinking and writing about and trying to write my own version of Jamie Stewart's auto fictive novel, Anything That Moves, forthcoming this spring from And Other Stories. I published an essay about the book, which I have not read, in Fence. Prior to writing about anything that moves, I interviewed Jamie about his band Shoo Shoo for Gold Flake Paint. They are avant-garde electronic rock music legends, and you should know them if you don't. Jamie is kind, funny, unafraid to name the demon, and frequently fosters kittens. He is also a trained social worker, which feels evident in the way Shushu's music serves to affirm its fans' vulnerabilities. I can't wait to finally read his book. Thank you for joining us today, Jamie. Thanks, Claire. It's nice to see you. Um, uh, the, this is a, a vignette called uh, Dottie Cisneros from the aforementioned Anything That Moves. Um, I have a really terrible cold. Please forgive my extra butch tone of voice. For a while, I went to a tiny school, about 25 students per grade. The kids all stayed at their desks, and the teachers changed rooms for every subject. Almost everyone there started in kindergarten, so they'd grown up together and were intensely territorial. I started in the fifth grade and was teased mercilessly the entire year for saying the word like a lot for parting my hair in the middle and for only wearing black iron-on movie monster t-shirts. Uh, I cried to my parents and they answered in the way they often did with a rousing, life isn't fair. In some ways, their motto made me more realistic and self-reliant, and in some ways it made me callous and viciously self-preservatory. The meanest girl in class with whom I would later share my first kiss underwater at a pool, pair, pool party and with whose older brother, my sister would unhappily lose her virginity, called me Rainbow Man relentlessly, like a hundred times a day for reasons I have never understood. She had a flat, turned up pig nose, and the brother had a pig nose too. His unachieved goal in life was to manage a fat burger in the valley. She now works as a bank manager on the Death Star. The next year, I wasn't fresh fruit anymore, and therefore was obliged to terrorize the next new kid. As a class, we managed to run off at least one incoming student per semester, one for being a Hesher, one for having what we decided was a Russian accent, one for having a pelvic brace as a result of having survived a near fatal car accident, and as if we were all the low headed, excuse me, and as if we were all the low foreheaded employees of some small town meat packing plant in the 1950s, one for dressing fashionably on and on the breaking wheel must have been. Dottie started in the eighth grade, the last grade that school offered. She was the tallest person in the class, which saved her from being hassled by the feckless boys. But she was the most fit, physically developed, which meant the trendy girls gave her a ton of shit. Half the class was obsessed with her, but afraid of her powerful grip. And half the class wanted to be her, but was threatened by her vast puberty. She seemed to float above the hand wringing mayhem of the court. Some days she read by herself under a tree. Some days she hung out with the nerd girls and traded Robotech comics, comics. And some days she played basketball with a couple of jock boys and took their $5 sunglasses if they lost. From what I could tell, she wasn't openly messing around with anyone in our school, though there weren't that many of us and we had all already made out with everyone else. So what would it have mattered? I assume she must have had an older someone at another school. We didn't talk much. Our lockers were inside our classrooms. Mine was the lower one behind the teacher's desk. I started getting really into music at that point, trying to be an art fag, and was crouched down, taping a magazine page of David Byrne, 
onto the inside of my locker door. Dottie slid up and faced me with her knees against my knees. She said, I'm going to show you my tits, and unbuttoned her shirt. Her bra was lace, unpadded, front clipped with no underwire and neon yellow. Her skin was dark brown, and the bra was magnificently bright against it. My mind turned to sand. She was beginning to unfasten it when suddenly she snapped her shirt, closed hard. Looming over us was Mrs. Spans. She was the strictest and most uptight of our teachers. A no hand-holding rule had just been enacted at the school, so this bra thing was explosively unallowed. Mrs. Spans asked what we were doing, and Dottie, without looking up, and in a totally uncool, excessive French accent said, using our heads, talking about talking heads. It was obvious she was holding her unbuttoned shirt closed, but I think Mrs. Spans knew she wouldn't be able to handle that much complication and jelly. After breathing on us for a minute, she walked away. From where my desk was assigning her class, I had a view out of a narrow window that I guess would have been used for ventilation before there was central cooling. It had a metal screen over the top of it to keep it from being broken by rocks, I assumed, because it was too small for anyone to fit through. Mostly I was a good student, not because I cared about school, but because things were so disordered at home. It was something solid to hold on to. That said, I was taken to long periods of not paying attention, staring out that window at the crisscrossed blue sky. I was preoccupied with thoughts of someone I love being killed in an earthquake by a collapsed building and pulling their body out of the pulverized concrete by their arm. Every night now, still looking for something solid to hold on to, I say this prayer. Jesus Christ, in your most holy name, please prevent a medium or big earthquake from affecting any populated place in the universe. After our behind the locker thing, Dottie and I started to say hi every day, but other than that, didn't talk any more than we had before. The class was going to take its traditional end of the year retreat to the circularly named Camp Village Duel Lutheran Camp. After we got there, Dottie told me that she wanted to go on a walk alone with me. She looked into my face, coquilaquat and black glitter nimbus around her and smiled. There was a lot of free time, but boys and girls weren't supposed to go into the woods alone. So as a boy and a girl alone, we discussed that we had to be quiet about it and slick. We were confident we could handle the escape, but it was even easier than we thought it would be. There was not an adult in sight. My sister later became a teacher and told her students, oh, and took her students to that same camp and told me that all the teachers drank boxed wine the entire time, so it made sense. We walked for a little while, not far, but far enough, and straddled a mossy log facing each other. Even though it was almost summer, it was pretty cold, and we were wearing pants instead of shorts, so the bark didn't bug us. We started to kiss. I made out a few times before and had one slick, Shasta Wilmont's boobs. Shasta and I had been laying on a beach, and I pulled off her shirt and bra and went for it. The waves came and drenched us, and people could see everything we were doing. I thought it would be like a cool music video, but it was freezing and sand got up and everything. Several people walked by us, baldly staring, baldly staring. Our tableau, Shasta later told me, was above and beyond agonizing, and she retreated from any further confidences. Daddy, however, seemed above and beyond comfortable with what might happen and into it. She placed both of her hands, she placed both of her hands on my thighs. I want to see your dick and I want us to fuck. My field of vision went all pale. I had never heard anyone say the F word out loud in this context didn't mean it. I told her I wanted to wait until I was in love with someone. I have no idea if I really felt this way. But the part, the part of me getting really into music was also trying to be excessively romantic. I once walked down Nordoff Street wearing no shoes, no shirt, and a beret. I was holding a red rose and a small pewter stallion in my blue jeans pocket that I had painted gray with a pedestal of green grass. I planned to give them to the first cute person I saw. No one came along, so with a great flourish, I cast my heavenly rose into the street and watched cars run over it. She said, but all guys want it. I said, I don't wanna be like all guys. Again, I'm not sure if I meant this, if I was just scared or if I was trying to develop an irredeemably painterly identity. I do clearly remember saying this though, and it makes me want to hold my 14-year-old self face down in the mud. She looked away and said it was okay. We sat on the log and talked some more and kissed a little more. We were in the forest, so there were birds singing over our heads. They draped pink and blue ribbons around our shoulders. 
a toad wearing a waistcoat and a monocle rolled up to us, driving a tomato on with rubber wheels. He pulled out his pocket watch and croaked at us wildly that we were late for our next Bible study. We graduated junior high and never saw each other again, though we did talk on the phone a few times. During the summer, she sent me a card. Before I could read it, my mom took it. She was in the habit of prying open my personal development. She read my diary, listened in on the other end of the line when I was on the phone, took secret past and class notes out of my book bag, and as here, read my mail. She and my dad would make fun of me for what I would say and write to people. Once, I guess, they saw me kissing someone when I didn't know it and mockingly acted out how I behaved and what I'd look like and why I did it. Until I was in my late 30s, I had to concentrate to get my parents out of my head while I was having sex, but there were a lot of other shitty reasons for that too. My mom shrieked, who sent you this? The card had a cartoon chola dressed in booty shorts and a bikini on the front with a big smile on her face. And it said, do you have a license to carry that weapon? On the inside of the card was a cartoon bull with a smirk on his face. And in red marker, it read XOXO, XOXO, the Miss Dottie Cisneros. My mom was real tweaked and I didn't want to risk the guaranteed ridicule by explaining everything. So I told her it was just a friend being funny, which was true. Thinking of Shasta before making out with her on the beach, it never occurred to me that someone might not like doing such not might not like doing something sexual with the person they were dating. That made me feel bad and shook me up deeply, but very slowly. Gradually, I became more and more passive and even regressively against being physically forward with anyone I was going out with. In high school, I was broken up with twice for being too demure and other than Shasta and despite and despite Dottie's best efforts, I didn't see another real human boob until I was 18. Thank you so much, Jamie. I can't Thanks, wait Claire. to read the full book. That was amazing. This bra thing was explosively unallowed. Next up, we have Orna Goralnik. Writing at the intersection of critical theory and psychoanalysis, Dr. Orna Goralnik's body of elegant writing covers motherhood, reproductive technology, and the so-called traditional family as a phantasma, to borrow her language, among other topics. As the host of the television series Couples Therapy, Orna performs a service to both her clients and viewers, providing what Margie Morris refers to as, quote, direct help and indirect guidance for everyone watching, end quote. I was personally compelled to explore Orna's oeuvre as a writer when I paused couples therapy to study her bookshelf and noticed a copy of Rosemary Waldrop's Curves to the Apple on it. Quote, couples therapy sage Dr. Orna Goronik knows you're looking at her bookshelves, end quote, proclaims the title of an IndieWire interview with her. It's also noteworthy that Orna started off as an experimental filmmaker, because what could be more experimental than a marriage? This question opens up by the minute while watching her program and while reading her prose. Please welcome Orna. Thank you, Claire. Um, and how great to spend this rainy Brooklyn afternoon in this context. Um, the, I'm going to read from, a, from a, an essay that I wrote um, in 2013 um, that was commissioned by my friend Stephen Hartman at the time when he, he um, put together a collection of essays called The Glass Coffin. And um, he posed to all of his writers the question, what age is desire? Um, so this is uh, from my hot toddler. Jasper is very particular about kisses. On a rare occasion, he may hold your face with both hands and stick an exploring tongue in your mouth, eyeing you to inspect the aftershocks. But most of the time, it's too much and don't touch my body. Aware of his human rights and of the hunger his capable body, red lips and dark features evoke, he plays us. 
He struts, Jasper, his little chest and shoulders decorated with tiny muscles, full metal jacket. Hips leading, he walks with a swagger, imaginary pistols and a score of steel drums. Linda Baker had a good piece in the New York Times on muzzling her desire for her children. The desiring maternal gaze is always at risk of being interpolated into a perversely perverse one that castrates rather than charges. People often comment about Jasper's deep raspy voice. I hit you, I kill you, you die. He seems to know something about his power. The truth is masculinity unravels me. I do not know what it means. It deranges my to the bone belief that we are polymorphously male, female, and the many variations in between. I think of masculine and feminine as categories that typically quietly serve top, bottom, or win, lose paradigms while foreclosing the variegations that come with multiple identifications. I do not know how to organize myself in response to Jasper's roars of war, his intense pleasure in imagining killing or attacks on my body. Is my resort to thinking gender an offensive mistake? Whether a Kleinian or masculine toddler, I want to send him for conversion therapy. I want what David Brooks protested against, a nurturing, collaborative, disciplined, neat, studious, industrious, and ambitious little boy. A toddler, power, sex, and aggression in a splendid bricolage. I've noticed that even his preschool teacher has taken to a particular morning greeting. Leaning against the classroom door, she narrows her eyes into a sly smile and slurs, hey, handsome an invitation Jasper usually squirms away from. For a split moment, she looks to me like a hooker at the door, soliciting. But then the charge softens. What do you want to work on today, sweetie? She asks, innocence restored. Kristeva's maternal position operates a transformation of, the, of libido in such a way that sexualization is deferred by a tendency towards tenderness. I am forever anticipating the day in which my reactions to Jasper, our many reads of him, sexy, menacing, cute, mischievous, will nachtraglichkeit assume the status of traumatic misrecognition, changing his unconscious with gender and sexual trauma. As sexy as this little dude looks in his Superman t-shirt, dark and messy, the full power of his appeal, of his sex appeal, bursts through when he puts on a princess dress, the pink one coveted by so many in his nursery classroom, and mostly the boys. The sparkles bring out the best of him. How does he look so masculine in drag? Jasper is different in the morning when he wakes up. He's in a rare state of surrender, a warm body still soft in dreams. His vulnerability invites an easy mother, uncomplicating. I pick him up and carry his body into the world, his entire being slumped on my shoulder, molding. Thinking about seems redundant with a soft body on your shoulder. But within minutes, he's armed with that roar of toddler energy that makes me want to flee, seek shelter among the bonobos. I want to run, but I stick it out with Jasper. There's no matriarchal alternative society. We are here in the capitalist West, getting dressed for another day at our progressive private school. I stay with his roars. I think about his roars so I can stay. I think in language, in discourse, and thinking about is when some trouble begins. Form and category shape experience into meaning. Thinking about invites, translates, interpolates, and forecloses. And when masculinity becomes a signifier, an abyss of Butlerian trouble opens up. Truth is, to confuse feminist queer sensibilities, this roar of his seems so darn masculine. Yet I honestly do not believe we have any access to what is essential about our nature. We have benefited from three feminist waves, two queer ones, 
I have been humbly convinced that all clues about the nature of things are always already saturated with ideology, gender being the most obvious. But Jasper manages to confuse me, not his singularity, but how to think about, signify who he is and what he evokes. He's such a boy, is the common reaction teachers and friends have to him, exactly the kind of comment I hate and resonate with when I see him run, run, and bang, bang, and pow, pow. I hit you, I kill you, you die. I'm perplexed. What language can I use to describe his body operating in space and on me? Is pow, pow gendered? Was he pow, powed into boyhood by us? Have his movements been choreographed into his DNA centuries ago? Or has he already met enough of us to know the dance of masculinity? He notices every detail about me. Hey mom, you have a boo-boo? He carefully observes and incorporates the entire choreography of how I speak and move. My hair ties, he absolutely must wear my hair ties. A classic fast Benjamin over-inclusive toddler. He does not distinguish between lip gloss from shovel. It's all taken in by his eyes, rehearsed and performed by his body. He handles body lotion and blush with the same exact devotion as a screwdriver and hammer, weapons of mass seduction. Jasper's playground. Of course he can do femininity if he so wants, yet somehow most objects, a piece of toast or the arm of a doll will ultimately find their way to represent a gun. Pow, pow, I kill you. I find his ways maddening. He can move his body through space with little concern for what he meets on his way to the imaginary bad guy he's fighting. Forward, out, up and on top. I'm amazed, but then overwhelmed. Too much destruction. It gets easier for me when he turns to verbally share the story he's caught in, his voice swelling with excitement, the words coming out frustratingly slow and failing to contain his action. Bad guy tied me up, he stuck. The big sky story of good and bad guys, of cowboys, firemen, of fairness and victory. He never wants to be the good guy or the savior. He wants me to be the good guys, abandoning him to the freedom and frenzy of kicking, burning and smashing us to pieces. Ha ha, his victorious voice. The passion in his destruction is intoxicating, but never fails to elicit waves of dis-ease in me. I try to join him, you're so strong, your body can fly, you can kill. I offer myself reassuring thoughts. He's a boy working on the translation of testosterone to mind. What am I doing? I seem compelled to frame who we are to each other through the lens of phallic narcissism and its common sibling domination. He's the emerging little man and I'm the admiring, desiring, albeit frightened mommy. I know that skit. Yet, inevitably, I can't stay and roll and am compelled to curtail the number of teddy bear homicides. Teddy is hurt. Why don't you check in on him? I want mutuality. Jasper is disappointed. This is no fun. Who are we and what is my job here? A hypernormative toddler to a queer castrating mother? Power, sex, gender, and aggression seeking meaning in a splendid bricolage. Stunning, Orna, thank you so much. He wants me to be the good guy, the good guys. And Selma, I'll hand things back to you. Claire, I, I think we've got some time uh, if you wanna read, a, read some of your work. I'll read a few short pieces and I know some folks, I think Jameson had to go to a session and of course, if anybody needs to leave. Um, feel free. I think this will follow up my hot toddler nicely to close. Um, I'm going to share three poems from my forthcoming chapbook, Wobegon, a collection of love poems to my cat who is named Wobegon. The poems will transition into a detourned excerpt from my recently completed book, Kind Mirrors, Ugly Ghosts, about a fictional pervert named David. In this excerpt, David's name is replaced with Wobegon. 
Wobegon, I spent the morning browsing mattresses, so I didn't write you this, nor did I order one. So too did you not order one, because you don't know of mattresses. Although you sleep on top of one and sometimes under one, and under the bed frame the mattress rests on where I can't find you. Wobegon, where are you? Come out and rest upon my lap as I navigate the specifics of memory foam, pressure relief, and the volatile organic compounds that get two stars of five for sex. Couples don't have to worry about a squeaky mattress when it contours minimally. Models that contain memory foam often hold the impression of an HBO marathon. When you came out this evening and stood in the sink, I observed you, sobbed, then refilled my waterbed. The truth. It is neither trapped inside you nor released, nor is it waiting to happen or already happening. It is not an opportunity missed, nor is it research you have yet to complete. It is not your poor work ethic, nor are you working too much. It is not because you don't have time, because you have some time. It is because you mismanage time that you micromanage it. Time is an hourglass, one twelfth scale. Have you ever lived in a dollhouse? An hour is 45 minutes and 45 minutes is 75% of an hour. It is not because I am good at math that I am telling you this. It is because the telescope next to the hourglass is next to a full length mirror and the full length mirror is next to a copy of Mazzy stars so tonight that I might see. Wobegon, I constructed this room for you not because I want to possess it, but because it is the true room. I am wearing this smile for Wobegon so she feels at home in my apartment. It stretches across my face like laundry drying in the yard. Yesterday, she laid flat across my tatsoi and destroyed it. So now I will plant wheatgrass for the cat a little bed where she can soil her paws. While she sleeps, a dam bursts. Wobegon makes me nervous. Like me, she is self-protective, skittish, unpredictable. She says what she wants with an authoritative tone that reminds me of a Catholic school principal. Show me your eyes, she commands. And when I do, she says they look troubled and in heat a description that turns me on. Yet what turns me on the most about Wobegon is that when I move toward her, she backs away. Love is a game of hide and seek, so says D.W. Winnicott, a dead psychoanalyst. And here on the floor of my unconscious, we swim toward one another, Wobegon and I, trapped as we are between death and waking life. I'm addicted to renting pornographic tapes at the video rental store by my apartment, Wobegon says, to which I respond, video rental stores still exist. Wobegon does not play piano. She does not make art. She does not go to the movies or museums or the grocery store. She does not drink. She does not eat meat. She does not work. She does not write books. Instead, she sits in my apartment in between jobs, she says, where all day she watches pornography. All I think about is fantasy and sex, Wobegon says, when I accidentally seek emotional support from her in the seventh month of our companionship. Although companionship is an inappropriate noun to apply to our dyad, a pet should give a human companionship warmth, unconditional care. In the seven months we have known one another, Wobegon has given me scraps. Wobegon is aloof and avoids people. I desire to bring out her softer sides, 
blur Wobegon's edges until her being dissolves into a narrative of faults, a pool of grief at which she finds herself in the center. There, I swim to her and take her paw and hold her and kiss her forehead and gently scratch her neck. And with this care on my behalf, all manners of Wobie's aloofness fall away and she begins to meow. It's okay, I say, holding her. I'm here. And in this moment, I experience what it feels like to be a mother, though I will never be a mother. I am barren in my solitude and the world is almost over. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much to the readers. This was phenomenal and I agree with Orna. I can't think of a better way to spend a rainy Brooklyn afternoon. Please support everybody's work um, by books in the computer, preferably not from Amazon. And I'm gonna hand things back to Anselm. Thanks so much, Claire. And uh, thank you for putting this together. And our thanks to Jeff, Orna, Anna, Jamie and Jameson for uh, spending time with us. In a minute, we'll throw open the, the mics. Everybody can say hello and goodbye as we head out into the rest of the day. The reading uh, has been recorded. It'll be up on the Brooklyn Rail website and on its YouTube channel in the next few days. And next week, we'll have a reading curated by Ari Lisner. So uh, please come back if you can for that one. And um, yeah, can we unmute everybody? Thank you so much. That was amazing, guys. Thank you Fantastic. so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> That's really okay. That's good work. Oh, wonderful, Uncle Boy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Anna. Yep. Thank you, Jemison. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Thank you all. It's great. Thank you so much for the reading. <laughs>